Welcome to Talking Education from the Varki Foundation. By entering conversations like this, you are helping to raise teachers' voices and give every child a quality education. Please watch, click, subscribe and start talking education. Our vision is quality education for every child, through work in the classroom to the highest halls of government. This new decade brings the opportunity to release the vital conversations usually confined to conference halls to the 2.65 billion people that use social media. Education debates aren't the preserve of academics. Everybody deserves to be part of them. Together, we have an opportunity to advance and bring a diverse audience into our mission as we discuss education's problems, collaborate on their solutions, and most importantly, show the incredible work of those on the front line of education. Welcome everyone to this new live conversation. And I'm very happy to introduce you all with Andres Alonso, Andrés is a former professor of practice at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and it's also the former CEO of the Baltimore City Public Schools, among many other places where Andrés has been working. And I will say Andrés has been transforming educational systems uh, in different parts of the United States. And from the United States have been supporting many other systems to improve, to transform, and to grow. So I'm very, very happy to, to have you, Andres, with us today. Thank you for your time. No, thank you. I, I was telling my friends that, uh, that this is a time for you to turn the table. Since four years ago, uh, I traveled to Argentina. Then I, I went back and, and saw part of your work and the work of uh, a lot of Argentinian principals and teachers and, and, and people in the provinces trying to uh, improve uh, what was happening in schools, and it was it was extraordinary. I ended up writing a case about it. So so this is this is sort of payback, as in uh, you get to ask me questions now, <laughs> and uh, I'm really ha I'm really happy to uh, to talk to you, Augustine. Not only because uh, I'm interested in what's happening in Argentina, but because this is such an important moment, and uh, you know it's a moment for great learning. Uh, but it's also a moment to really see, okay, so this, this is what we're really about in a way yeah. that we kind of knew already. Yeah, 100%. And I'm, I'm really happy to have the time to, to have this discussion. Um, I think you are someone to, who reflects a lot. Uh, so many of your lessons come from reflection. So I'm really looking forward to, to listening to your reflections on this period, this particular period of time. Uh, we, I, I go back very often in my mind to the, the first coffee we had together in New York more than five years ago and the, the whole journey that brings us here uh, and the things, your visit to Argentina, you participate in some of our conferences and also we do work together. The, the Harvard case that you wrote about our work here was very helpful. And it was an opportunity also to showcase and to promote what we were doing. Uh, and in the same way, we want to keep learning and to listen to your reflections, what is going on today, what is happening, and what is coming. What are the lessons and what we have to do in order to keep growing? My, my first question, Andres, just to kick off the conversation, is about the very personal for you, but what have you learned over this pandemic? <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I always told my team that if that if uh, that if we were learning until the results of tests, then we were not doing our job. That you know, tests should tell us what we already know in terms of of the work that we've done and the work that we see. And uh, in in some ways, uh, uh, in in the United States, part of what we're seeing is it, are things that we already knew, as in. You know, they are, there is huge variability uh, in terms of how the system works and how the different systems that make up this very decentralized system uh, have responded to the crisis. Uh, there, there, there are huge gaps in terms of access, in terms of capacity in different parts of the country. Uh, people have struggled with the shift from the in-person 
uh, schooling to to more personalized or or digital learning uh, in ways that that again should have been predictable. Since you know, I think back to all the different technologies that have been introduced over the past hundred years, and how seldom they have actually penetrated the classroom. There there is something that that feels almost like intrinsically human to the to the notion of a teacher and a group of kids in front of them and it's been really hard to uh to get past uh uh what has happened there, there has been huge disruption in terms of uh uh the many ways in which schools interact with their communities and people have struggled and uh uh at the same time, and I, I'm the beneficiary of having two next generation young teachers who have followed on the family tradition and have gone into teaching. And, you know, I've seen uh, how they have to adapt and what happened in their individual settings. I mean, one, one was a 21 year old first year uh, science teacher in a middle school and a high school. She was going from school to school. Uh, the other one was a fourth year uh, uh, math teacher in a K-8 school in a different district. And, you know, it, it, we had daily conversations about uh, <laughs> what was happening around tools, what was happening around individual students and groups, what was happening around guidance, what was happening around support, later conversations about accountability. And... Uh, uh, it was it was remarkable to see uh, the similarities, the differences, and the resourcefulness that I saw. Uh, their frustrations around uh, reaching all their students, around uh, communicating to the the, the higher ups in the systems, uh, things that maybe needed to change. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, that was that was remarkable to me for me to to basically go back 30 years in terms of my own journey and see some of the same concerns being replicated 30 years later for, you know, two people who are now at the beginning of their path and, uh, and, and dealing with some of the, of the challenges of today in ways that were quite similar to the ways in which, you know, I, I remember dealing with challenges uh, way before. I mean, we, we in the United States have a, highly fragmented system around authority, around guidance, around resources, uh, uh, a system which is not coherent in, in ways that, that uh, contrast with those of all the countries. I mean, Argentina is somewhere in the middle with a highly uh, influential central system and then um, flexibility yes. in, in the, in the in province. The yeah. yeah. But, uh, but in the United States, you have a federal government, you have 50 states, so you have 50 commissioners of education, you have uh, uh, 15,000 districts, and the default is towards local control. So in those 15,000 systems, you have superintendents, I was one of them, and you have school, mostly elective school boards of education making decisions about what's happening in schools. And then you have 100,000 schools and principals working with their faculties uh, in ways that don't always walk in step with what's yeah. happening at the federal, state, and district level. And then you have a system of private schools, which is uh, just as robust as uh, and as fragmented as the public school system and what i what i see is this this extraordinary diffusion of of authority responsibility uh innovation and resourcefulness uh that that creates a huge opportunity for learning about uh what's going on who's doing it better uh what works, what doesn't work, and yet a a very difficult process of harnessing all that information, deriving lessons, and then turning it around into policy and 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 new action. Uh, and and there is there is a there is at once a sense of uh, of urgency because of the disruption. There is enormous confusion. Uh, uh, and there is a, a an increasing sense that uh, that you know this 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 is going to have a a long lasting impact uh, 
that depends in some way with, with what's happening outside of school with the with progress in harnessing or, or, or responding to the pandemic with with real concern about learning loss and uh you know in my case since you know i i i taught uh students with disabilities english language learners uh, students in transition uh uh you know i worry about about what's happening especially with students in transition from eighth to ninth grade students that are in transition from 12th grade into the work world of uh, colleges, we we don't do a really good job of of mapping what happens with those students, and uh, I, I just worry about what's happening, especially with data systems that are lagging the moment. Uh, so, for example, there's been incredible difficulty with with uh, understanding attendance, understanding uh, who exactly is participating. Oh, yeah. That that that. You know, it's something so basic that that you know it's it feels like it should be easy to to manage. So imagine what happens around the the teaching and learning and the the difficulty the, the, of the learning process. Getting people to to act differently to access student knowledge or enhance student knowledge when so much of our culture of teaching is about synchronous learning. As in, you know, we we structure schools so that everybody's sort of going at the same pace, and you know, this is a moment where you know we we've lost the tools and we've lost the the contextual yeah. components that uh that that basically ensure that that's ha that happens. And I and I'm not saying that that's a good thing because I mean I have certainly struggled for 20 years with people just trying to do the same thing. Uh, but but it ensures a baseline, and I think now we've lost the baseline, and uh, and I'm not sure that we have the capacity to do what we always should have done well, which is meet every student at their point of entry and then catapult them to something else. Uh, when so much is getting defaulted to what's happening outside of school, and uh, and students are wrestling with a whole host of challenges. Uh, where some of the support that the schools offer are are missing. You know, I always said when I was leading Baltimore that uh, that both the safest and the the most instrumental uh, part of a student's life was was in the school. Uh, it was the thing that we had agency <laughs> over. I mean, we you know, I I was very frustrated with people who kept looking elsewhere. Uh, I, you know, I always felt that uh, that we, you know, we owned six, seven hours of a kid's life, and uh, and uh, you know, we needed to be incredibly responsive to parents and community in order to understand how best to use those hours. But uh, but it it was it always felt like an, a, a monumental waste of time to 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 not focus on the instrumentality of teachers and instrument and instrumentality of students as a group, uh, which is something that often we, we don't do, we don't do well. Uh, and now we've lost parts of that instrumentality and the question become, what works? Uh, uh, and yeah, I think yeah, lots of people that, are struggling that, with that. That's, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, one, that's one, one of the questions that came to my mind. If, if, who is doing it in a good way? What are the good lessons that you have learned when you are in contact with many different education systems? Then we can discuss if the decision being made at the local level or at the federal level, what is better. But let's leave that to the end. What would you say today there, there are good practices? Well, the, the, the challenge is that so much, first of all, we, we haven't had enough time. As in, you know, as always, in a moment of crisis, there is a the immediate need tends to be structural, as in, you know, even in, in what's being debated in the United States right now, which is, you know, do we open or do we not open? Do we open in person? Yeah. Do we open through remote learning? Do we open through some kind of hybrid process? Uh, th those are structural questions. Those are not questions about what's actually going on in learning. Uh, it's about the delivery system. It's not about content. 
so, so there is that challenge. I mean, if you look outside the United States, I mean, success is being defined by by just the ability to do something. And uh, and part of what we're seeing is is people doing it in very very different ways. I mean, you go from uh, you know places like. Uh, like uh you know in in uh denmark or in in australia where they kind of open you know one day at a time and uh they give a lot of flexibility to the schools to decide what to do and then they expand it to places like denmark where we they they kind of rolled the grades they started with the younger kids they try to keep kids sort of enclosed uh, and then you have other countries like Taiwan and now Singapore, where everybody's coming back, uh, everybody's wearing masks, and, uh, yeah. and, and it's kind of like a, a resumption of what had happened before here in the United States, because the, the, the virus, uh, you know, hit the country in such a variable way. So you had, you had the, yeah. the forced closing of the large Northeastern school systems, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, uh, uh, while the rest of the country kept going. Uh, and then you have a kind of rolling impact as, as things got worse or as the political pressure sort of like rolled in for what was happening. And, uh, and then you had, especially here in the Northeast where it, it went to remote learning very, very fast, you know, what, 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 what was very clear is that no one was ready for it. As in, you know, even, even though, I mean, yeah. remote learning happens in, especially in high schools with credit accumulation, with recovery in the more, uh, Ad, some of the more adventurous systems, some charter school systems, uh, uh, there's, there's, there tends to be still a lot of resistance to it, and it hasn't been done systematically. And some of the, some of the most effective schools in and school systems in the country have pushed against it. I mean, I will tell you, for example, that I I did a I did a lot of visits while I was in Boston uh, of the. Edward Brooke Charter Schools in Boston, and I have a lot of admiration for John Clark and Kimberly Clark, who ran those schools. And they push back on the idea of, of technology as the driver. They, they felt that the driver was the, capa the, the ability and engagement of teachers and high-level content, and I you know, had a lot of admiration of what they were about, uh, about what they were doing. So, 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 so I, I don't, I don't, I don't want this to sound like an evaluation, like people were not doing yeah. digital learning or technology, therefore they were not doing their job. I, I just, I just think that we, that part of what we know is that, and in the United States, we have been so lucky and so privileged as in, you know, I, I taught kids from Ghana, kids from Central America when I was a teacher in Newark and, you know, and in New York, uh, you know, we had programs for for what we call life kids, kids with uh, interrupted formal education, uh, because we yeah. were getting kids who were coming with like five, six years of interrupted education because of civil wars or because of, of natural disasters. So we 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 are so pro we have been so protected again, so lucky and so privileged. That that we have n we have never thought of the kinds of even short term interruptions. I hope that we're experiencing right now, and part of yeah. what we part of what now feels like a lack of readiness was was a way of life. And uh, uh, you have some organizations that have made you know digital learning a kind of way of life, but they have they have felt at the margins. Now they move to the center, and the question is, you know, what what have we what can we learn from them? You know, Summit Learning, yeah. Khan Academy. Yeah. What can we learn from them? And uh, and what what happens moving forward kind of depends on what's happening with the health crisis. As in my my prediction is that if the health crisis goes away, that you know the, there will be a gravitational pull back to what 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 we've always done. With some margins, you know, some marginal work, uh, 
uh, it's part of a larger conversation about how learning should take place because you know many teachers constantly complain about the interference of outside interest in kids engagement. Yeah. Uh, you know, they 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 talk about gaming or they talk about you know social media like it's 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 it shouldn't be the core of what kids are doing yeah. and how they learn. But the reality is that 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 for most kids today, they they're getting their information not necessarily from books and school. From, they're getting it on, from, from the yeah. app. In, but, in ways that kind of like uh, amplify what happened with television in past generations. And in a way, it kind of amplifies what happened with a kid like me from books. I mean, books are, is, books are, are uh, uh, a way of learning that sometimes shuts out, uh, uh, you know, more formal uh, uh, systems. Uh, 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 so I, I think we're going to have to integrate uh, uh, those new processes of communication and learning in ways that we haven't done uh, before. And, you know, the, 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 the book is out about exactly how that's mm -hmm. going to happen. The smarter systems are going to do it better. And I, unfortunately, and this is one of the tragedies uh, of, of like the, the normal running of schools, not necessarily this moment, is that, uh, that you have great variation in 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 capacity and ability among adults in the system and what we've seen in the past and we've we've known this for 30 years is that when you when you have a ch when you have a change in the environment that demands that schools do something different for example the standards based movement in the 90s no child left behind uh, uh and i will bet today uh, <laughs> The, the the systems that were already better at the routine, the system that had coherent system man coherent systems of instruction, uh, adapted faster and better. And yeah. uh, in the same way that in a that in a school system, you know, where you have where you have a great principal, you're going to have much quicker responses to the moment and more creative uses of people's capacity, teachers, et cetera, et cetera, than, than in schools that are struggling. And, uh, and you know, there's this huge correlation between, between the, the ability of the principal, the, the, the ability of a staff to collaborate, which tends to uh, uh, correlate to the ability of the principal and then how they tackle problems. So, yeah. uh, so my, my, my expectation is that we're going to see the same thing. And I, and I will bet you that in Argentina, it will be the same thing that you could, you already know the places that are going to, that you're going to need to look for, for and, what yeah. happens next. And they're, they're not necessarily, they're not going to surprise you. There are people who have already been ahead of the game until now. Yeah. yeah. No, no I, I, you made you made great statement there. Yeah. I'm taking notes of that to come, come back. Um, we need your advice on how to promote better leadership in order to to grow faster or to adapt in a faster way. So, well, for sure that some of the principles or some of the systems are going to adapt faster, but we need your advice on how to help the ones that are getting behind. But first of all, let me ask you something that for me is critical at this time. That is, the, the question will be, are we having the right conversation today? We, we are listening to many discussions uh, about, a lot of them about politics, most of them about uh, health and health systems, some of them about the economy, and less, but something about education. When we discuss education, we discuss about how the new classroom has to be, how we evaluate the infrastructure, the teacher's role, uh, many different conversations. Is that the right conversation to have right now? Is any other topic that we need to bring into the table or some things that we need to bring into the agenda to be discussed today that is not there? Well, I, you know, part of what is interesting, and you know, maybe I'm talking, maybe it's the United States because the United States is a, is on a is on a, at a pivotal moment right now. We're dealing with with a with a short term uh, uh, policy crisis around health, and we're reading we're dealing with a with a uh, 
generations long, uh, history long, multiple uh, policy cycles long, huge uh, crisis or failure around issues of equity, issues of race, issues of uh, uh, diversity, issues of access, issues of, of equality. Uh, so everything is on the table here, Agustin. I don't think that we that we are at a moment where we could talk about schools and not talk about many other things. And I don't think that we we should ever have been at that moment. I, you know, schools are are manifestations, reflections of their communities and uh, the systems that surround them, the people, and you know, the heart and souls of. Uh, the people who work in them, the people who send their kids there, and the kids themselves. So, so uh, you cannot be a school and, and not in some way be be engaged with with a set of aspirations about who we are as a community. We shouldn't be anyway. So right now, uh, all that feels on the table, and of course, there's there's a there's a pull. By the by, managers and by the people who have to implement to 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 simplify and narrow and and think technically about uh, what needs to happen because people have a job to do they have a task and they focus on that task and of course the danger is that in focusing on that task you you know you you narrow the aspiration in ways that replicates the past rather than than what needs to happen. Uh, but, I, but, I, but I do feel that everything is on the table, that, that there's, there's a fundamental self set of questions about what schooling should be in relationship to learning that have always been on the table. I mean, this is the reason why, you know, we feel that we are in, in cycles of school reform. The, the only reason why there are cycles is because, you know, long before us, somebody saw gaps and people were dissatisfied and... They went at it in a certain way and they failed. And then we come back again. And, and you know, the, the question becomes is why do we keep failing? And, uh, yeah. and whether, we're, whether we're missing something fundamental about the systems that surround schools. Uh, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a huge yeah. open question for us. The, yeah. the, right now. If, if I were back on, uh, on, you know, if I were leading a system right now, and, you know, right now, as you know, mostly I, I, I uh, participate in boards and, uh, and provide, you know, help with strategy, uh, but, uh, and write, as you know. But, uh, but if, I, if I were leading a system right now, I would be uh, thinking really hard about feedback loops as in, you know, whatever I do, uh, uh, it, can, it can't be set in stone because the situation is so dynamic and we know so little. So, so there has to be a, a, an approach that, that constantly brings back evidence, voices uh, uh, about what's happening. I mean, and it just can't be supervisory voices and it just can't be leaders either. I mean, uh, uh, you know, what would happen if we are, if we start thinking about how we open from the perspective of kids, right? Uh, 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 so, so what, so, so whatever happens, build in the feedback loops. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the challenge is so extraordinary logistically that, uh, that, I mean, think transportation, think students with disabilities, uh, think health protection for the adults. Think uh, 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 what happens with buildings in relationship to kids. I mean, those buildings were not uh, built for social distancing. Uh, think resources. You now, you now have, you, you know, we, we can predict a, a, a major decline in, in per pupil uh, and and a loss of a generation of teachers, as in you know, if you if if budgets get reduced and some teachers have to go, it's going to be the younger teachers. Yeah. Uh, uh, so 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 the, the the logistical challenges are so huge that 
that you know it explains why they fall back to the technical. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that's when the opportunities that crises provide are lost. And uh, you know, I, I always think about how it's so much easier to be a revolutionary than a, than <laughs> than, a, than a manager <laughs> because. Yeah. You know, you, you. I remember, for example, when I was uh, in Baltimore and we were pushing for two billion dollars to rebuild schools, and I was going hard at the issue of, you know, we, you know, kids come first. We need the money. We need the money. We need the money. And uh, and getting and and my my mayor, my major, my mayor, uh, Stephanie Rollins Blake, who was a great ally and uh and who wanted the schools to do well she kept holding back in a way that frustrated the hell out of me uh and I, of course i was frustrating the hell out of out of her because i was so not willing to compromise on the fact that she needed to think about fire station she needed to think about playground she needed to think about uh housing she needed to think about community uh centers and basically my stance was like i don't care schools come first thankfully she came around and she was so instrumental to our getting the money from the state etc cetera, etc cetera, that uh, that i will never be able to repay her but uh, but that was a two year sort of like push and pull situation where she she needed to match she had 2000 balls up in the air and she was she needed to keep them up in the air i just had one and uh, uh, in relationship to that issue, I mean, if you came back to me and talked about running the school system, it was the same thing. Uh, uh, and, and I think everybody's trying to simplify in a similar way. And right now it's about structure. There's so much confusion that people are trying to get a handle on exactly, you know, how can they plan? I mean, by now, in the normal cycle of U.S. educational life, uh, you know, every t every system got their budgets in March and April. They already have their uh, teacher rosters, et cetera, et cetera. No one has that ready now. And we're like a month and a half from uh, from September and some systems uh, open a lot earlier. So everybody's trying to get at a kind of like basic architecture that will then allow them to to wrestle with all the other things and of course the challenge with that is that you then you know it makes it really really hard to to think about the higher aspirations and yeah. uh and, and and people feel people feel that they cannot afford to start from scratch in ways that at the larger system levels in a way that if you're just managing a school it becomes easier i think charter schools uh, have an advantage in that sense. They're nimbler, they're smaller. Uh, uh, it gets harder the larger the organism. And uh, uh, in the United States, I said 15,000 districts before, uh, you know, you, you have the range from one or two assistants with one or two schools to New York City, which has 1,700 schools and, you know, uh, a million kids and 100,000 teachers. So how how do you start from scratch with a yeah. million kids and another yeah. hundred thousand teachers and you, you can't so yeah. so at best you need to you need to allow for the for the places where you're going to provide enough freedom for people to take risks and you need to protect those places and then see what you learn from them uh, and and there's an opportunity here I think that one huge mistake that systems can make is to have uh, uh, there should be guidance and there should be yeah. support and there should be consistency around certain things, but it shouldn't be unitary and set in stone. I think that that will be that will be the death knell or of, of any learning. It, it will maintain things, but I don't think anybody's going to learn from it. And I think that right now we need to. So so uh, wh where do you provide space for collaboration, for reflection? You used the word reflection earlier. And, uh, you know, I like to think that I base my reflection on my feet being planted on the ground, by the way. But, uh, but uh, because I've had to, you know, keep so many balls up in the air before. But I, I, I do think that, uh, that uh, there, has to be, there has to be space for people trying to do new things and failing miserably and not getting hit over the head with it. And at the same time, you have to keep up front that there, there, are, there are all kinds of pressures on the society 
to to wrestle with with uh, uh, gaps that were there before. Yeah, uh, and 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 will continue to be there unless we do something really radically different. So what can that be now as to your work i mean i you know one of the reasons why i wrote the case is because you were doing work that was so squarely based on principles or directors as you call them in argentina and 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 they're opening themselves to different ways of doing the work and then understanding that it was never about the leader him or herself it was always the leader with with a group of people with the community uh, yeah with yeah. the community if you if you you know it, it it doesn't work if you come in with a set of ideas if other people do not understand your ideas don't agree with the pace of your ideas don't don't feel that they're somehow outside of the the circle of your ideas so how do you how do you, so then how do you how do you bring those ideas especially when you have a sense of urgency and a clear clear notion that that whatever is going on is not right uh uh so that that's the challenge in in improvement in uh in that, that in in transformation that i that i think the crisis provides entry points that we didn't have before uh, at the same time, again, the gravitational pull is towards the reestablishment of routines. And uh, I, I think that's both absolutely necessary. I mean, I have lots of friends in this work, as you know, who are leading systems. Yeah. And, uh, when they're talking to me, they're not, they're not talking to me about, okay, so how do, we, how do I blow it up? They're basically talking to me around, okay, so how do I do this and not fail miserably? Yeah. And, uh, and so they, the accountability is less about what's going to happen five, ten years from now as a result of this work and more about, you know, in the next year, how do I make sure that that we don't fail miserably around? Yeah, for sure. The, and, uh, and I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure when you're talking to Isolda and Susana and all these people, it's exactly the same thing. Yeah, and yeah, we are giving a lot of a lot of thoughts to the short term. So also, this conversation helps us to think for the long term as well. I really like some of the statements that you made, and I'm taking notes, and I invite the audience to take notes because you talk about feedback as a playing a critical role uh, on thinking what it's coming next, and you also mentioned the community, not only the leader. So we need communities. Uh, leaders with the community thinking together on what's coming next. And I think that's a critical piece of advice uh, that we need to make sure that that happens in all the levels, happens at the federal level and that the similar discussions are replicated in the local level, in a school, in a principal, with the team, the parents discussing together. So that, that I think, and I, I'm taking from you that it will play a critical role. Let me... Let me ask you one more question. Um, for sure, there will be failure, and you were saying that uh, the gap or the inequality gap is going to be bigger than before. We will have, unfortunately, and we will we, we don't like the idea, but we will have a larger dropout on schools, probably. What do we have to do different there? Uh, I, you know, uh, this is this is the 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 sort of like the 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 pivotal piece where where i think that 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 schools and school systems need to need to think different sizes and different solutions uh i don't think that we should just accept the i mean there, there are going to be gaps but there have been gaps until now and uh and the, the huge failure of education systems is is not be able to close those gaps in the way that they should uh, uh, so I, 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 you know, I, I, that's the place where you now need innovation and you need to persistence and you need, uh, I, I don't think that we should be accepting kids dropping out, which is, you know, what happens all the time. A kid grad drops out, there are all the rosters and, you know, there, there need to be nudges and a set of incentives that now become about bringing those kids back. Uh, I, you know, I mentioned transitions as a, as a key point earlier and uh that's part of what i meant as in you know everybody who's in a ninth grade in the united states and in a 12th grade in the united states and in and in that transition from ninth to tenth grade which is a huge 
sort of like dropout point here in the United States in a lot of systems. I think that there has to be something uh, at the local level and at the at the state and national level that, that pushes resources and pushes new uh, types of solutions towards kids in those levels. I mean, we're not going to get the dropouts in the elementary grades. Uh, uh, the question there is going to be about learning loss and acceleration and new new types of solutions. So, so what do we do with the populations that we know are more marginal? And, and uh, uh, are, 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 we, are we ready to not make it all the same for everybody? As in, I, I'm like flabbergasted in a way by, by how much of the conversation is about, you know, parents against the parents for, as in, give people their choices. That, that might take care of the space issue. And then, and then the question becomes, okay, if you're in school, we need to develop a set of, if you're, if you're in the physical building, we need to develop a set of solutions. Uh, for the kids who are there, with parents who want to send the kid, the kids there, and if you're and if you're you know part of that group of parents who want to keep their kids at, at home, at home, then, yeah, you can still be another set of solutions. Like, I don't, I don't yeah. see the the you, we do it all this way or we don't do it all yeah. a different way. Uh, I think that this is a moment when we need to have flexibility. We need to think scenarios. Yeah. We need to have different sizes. We need to have different approaches. We might need to narrow. As in one of the huge criticisms of the American school system uh, uh, compared with other places in the world is that we've been so wide in the range of the things that we attack. Well, you know, this, this might be a time where we narrow. And, uh, and I don't mean narrow like only teach English and math. Uh, yes. It means that if, we, if we're teaching social studies or science, we might need to teach only one or two things, but do it really, really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and create modalities where something might be happening digitally, something that might be happening through books. I mean, I pay $10 a month for, uh, for a digital subscription to every single book in the world. Uh, that's, a lot, that's a lot cheaper than what school systems yeah. pay for materials. So, so uh, you know, some... So those kinds of solutions, I think that are, yeah. that are absolutely necessary. And in the in the meantime, we need to figure out a, a way to get teachers to communicate and problem solve together and identify every single child who's at risk. I mean that that was the question and the key. Yeah. Thirty years ago, when I started, thirty four years ago, when I started doing this work, right, that so many kids were getting lost and nobody was really owning that. It's the same question now. So the, the crisis exacerbates and brings to the surface the problems that we already have. And, yeah. uh, and uh, it, it just heightens heightens the bar. But yeah, it, it, also, it also makes it maybe a little bit more possible that we might be able to jump over it. To, yeah, to respond, it makes it more clear. I think the, the crisis at the end is giving us some transparency on issues that we already have, but we were not addressing as the, the way we, we need to do that. Um, I, I like your idea. I think the, the more freedom and, and addressing the problem in different ways and offering different solutions, I think it's critical. It's things that we are doing in, in other industries and, and we have to bring into the education. But are we ready? Are we really ready to deliver or to make learning possible for everyone in different ways? Are teachers able to that? We need to think about a new teacher training process or how can we make that happen? Well, I think in the long term, obviously, lots of things need to happen around pipelines, around uh, uh, teacher preparation, uh, leadership preparation. Uh, collaborative models of, of learning, the types of support that teachers uh, get. I mean, uh, I spent uh, 13 years as a teacher and I, I think I only got uh, visited twice. Uh, it's very different now. I mean, one of the, one of the things that, that I don't think get enough attention is, is how much more improved the process of supporting teachers is today than what it was 30 years ago. But, uh, but you know, there they ha they has to be a different way of thinking about uh, working with teachers or teachers working with each other uh, in order to in order to get to improvement. 
of, of course, we're not we're not going to be ready to do this well, uh, and we shouldn't be expected to to be able to do this well. What we should be expected to do, which is why we, I talked about different sizes, different approaches, feedback loops, is to improve. And uh, uh, one gap, one huge gap, is that uh, you know I'll ask you. I mean, you you are working with thousands of principals. I mean, how many schools have processes of continuous learning and improvement that have been codified, that are that are being passed from cohort of teacher to next cohort of teacher, that are focusing on a problem of practice and then uh, move from that problem of practice to the next iteration in, in ways that leads to learning. This could be the problem of practice, but without that kind of culture of improvement, without that kind of orientation to what, what education should be. I mean, education should, should never stop for the kids and for the adults. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be very difficult to do, which is, again, one of the reasons why we tend to go back to a kind of mechanistic uh, uh, way of doing the work uh, that, that has basically defined education. You know, we, we tend to talk about America or the United States in relationship to that. But, you know, I've now been to enough places around the world where I, I always come out saying, wait a second, it's, that, that looks awfully familiar. Uh, uh, right? <laughs> As in, I mean, it's so funny when, when I was in conversations in Argentina and, and, you know, people were talking to me like I had spent my entire life in Argentina. And, uh, no, uh, but what I saw was, was, was my entire life, at least for the last 30 years. And, and the challenges were, were very similar. So, so I, I do think that the work is fundamentally about adults learning how to do their work better and uh, and about the surrounding systems you know the 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 leaders the 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 ministers the you know everybody north of the school uh reorienting yeah. their work in order to to take problems out of the school provide resources provide access to new knowledge and new ways of doing the work i mean that's that's how i define my work as a leader in baltimore and new york and uh, uh, it remains the way that I that I define the work right now. And then the question is, do we have the capacity not only in the school but outside of the school to provide for that kind of support? And the 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 historical evidence suggests that we do not. But mm -hmm. the moment the moment uh, suggests that we have to. And uh, and uh, as always in education, there are always so many extraordinary people in this in this work and those extraordinary people who are found at the level of the school at every level and uh are always provide like like great hope in terms of uh of uh of uh of what can happen uh, uh so you know i'm i'm all as always i think that you know you you cannot lead schools in or any system if you do not if you if you don't if you don't think capable of improving, uh, in the same way that you know you cannot raise your kids if you think they're going to fail. I mean that that yeah. makes you that will make you a terrible parent. So so uh, you know we we have to be open to the reality of failure and what we can do about it. But also we have to be open to the the possibility of great success. And our responsibility becomes to identify where it's happening to nurture it, to, to scale it, yeah. uh, and to advocate like crazy for, uh, for what needs to happen with the authorizers, because that's the other piece that, I mean, schools are so mired in the politics of places that, uh, that the work of leading schools, you know, I, 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 you know, I once met somebody who basically says, I, I can't do that because it's political. And my response is like, excuse me, like, what the hell do you think this work is about? As in, the, uh, the, the, like, it's, it's about making things happen. Yeah. And things happen is about power, it's about authority. And uh, if, you're, if you're a principal, if you're a school leader, you have so much informal authority in your community. You have uh, potentially so much uh, 
that you can that you can add to to solutions that aggregate around, across schools. So I, I think I think that this is a moment where people need to be to be advocating for what needs to happen in schools. Yeah. Well, it's it's what you're doing right now today with us, and and we really enjoy the the conversation because you're bringing a realistic scenario about what is happening, but with your quote of optimism and you are bringing hope you always do uh, uh, on the way you understand education and how you promote education i think we need more people like you as well pushing like you were pushing to your mayor to bring more more of the budget and, and more awareness to the education system so i hope we can keep you around shouting about the importance of education and and what to do because Your optimistic message is also together with very specific content and your experience, things that you did in the past that work and that could be working right now. So uh, I think we have to wrap up because we are running out of time. I will like before ending, as I said before, I take a lot of notes. We will be sharing this with our audience, with teachers, with school leaders and with the community in general thoughts about the conversation, because I, I truly believe they were really useful and it's the message, it's the right message we have to share. Uh, but before wrapping up, I will ask you the last piece of advice. Uh, what would you like to see new? Because you mentioned very clear that problems that we have today are the ones that are we are bringing from the past. What is something that you would like to see in the next couple of months as a response to the crisis i i, I you know i i kind of uh i i it was already in what i said I, i do i do think that if we are that if if we are responding with structural structural technical measures to a set of challenges that are ultimately about people and kids we will be making huge mistakes as in Everything is predictable. We ha we already have enormous amounts of information about who the kids are and who the adults are. The the best systems are going to open with already a prioritization around kids, specific kids that should have been expected to drop off, to lose, to fall by the wayside they will open with an understanding of who in their leadership communities require a lot of supports. Uh, there, there, there should already an un be an understanding of who struggled between March and June in relationship to what was happening with digital learning. Those people need support. And uh, those kids need to, they need to have flags, you know, on their shoulders yeah. uh, for others. And to the extent that, that, you, that, you, that you were right in, in predicting the, the dropout, the drop off, the, the struggle, then the responsibility is on you to do something about it, which requires that you have systems that track what's happening with those kids and those adults, that you have support measures Now, maybe you have new settings, that you have new solutions. If you open with a technical solution around, oh, we're going to do hybrid, or we're going to do this, or we're going to do spacing, or we're going to wear masks, or we're going to give out laptops, then, then yeah, you, you will be doing, the, you will be falling to the lowest common denominator around what you need to do. And, and you might be given lots of props because you have hit your marks, but you will fail. And uh, 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 that's, that's, that's what I want to see in the short term. In, in the long term, I want us to keep coming back to, those, to, to that notion of what schooling should be, what schools should be, how learning should be taking place in ways that are both aspirational, but are again always coming back to specific children specific adults 
specific definitions of what the good is. I mean, we yeah. should all have a definition of the good, as in, for this to be good, the following things need to be happening with these outcomes. And uh, that's no different in a pandemic than it was five years ago or 10 years ago or 30 years ago. Uh, the dynamism of the moment allows maybe for something different. So, so I, I think in, we, we, in the longer term, that's, that's what we need to do. And then thirdly, I'm giving you three things rather than one, uh, that there's no way of, of I, I think that if you're an intelligent person, I'm gonna be that categorical, you, you cannot shy away from the fact that kids are doing their learning, so much of their learning outside of school, that they're communicating outside of school. I know that somebody had a question about communication. Well, kids are communicating among each other and we're on the outs. We, we need to find mechanisms to, to bring in that, that new language, that new way. You know, kids are hives. We need, we, need to bring that, we need to bring the norms of that hive into schools and, uh, and make it about schooling while we, we, we do a much better job of communicating with each other about uh, uh, our hopes, uh, our fears, and also our norms and aspirations. I think that, uh, that, that, that becomes a key moving forward. Yeah. Well, I, I really like that question, and I think that for all of us to think about what is the school that we want, what is good. Uh, it's good. Yeah. I really look forward to your next visit to Argentina to answer that question. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to be in the stage, and that, that is going to be our first question. But again, uh, we run out of time. I have to wrap up here. But I, I want to thank you again, Andres, for, for your time. For your I, wore a, I wore a blazer for you, Augustine. Yeah. You haven't worn a blazer in like three months. <laughs> and in the middle of your summer. So much appreciated. And we really enjoy. Thank you for your, as I said before, for your reflections, but also for your smile and, and this optimistic message that you are bringing us, that the energy that you share and as some of the very deep ideas, you talk about responsibility, accountability, the sense of urgency, and you say many times that none of this is uh, set in stones, uh, but some of your message today must be set in stones. And uh, I will make sure that we share these thoughts with many others, because I, I believe it's the right message to, to give. Uh, it's about working together. It's about thinking what's coming next and giving different solutions. So you give us some energy to keep doing what we are doing. And we really thank you for, for that. This is a, a new step in the long journey that we are together uh, in order to transform the education systems not only for us in Argentina, for you uh, all over the places. So in that way, we want this to be one of many other conversations. And as Argentinian, I want to, to have you back here as soon as possible. So you're more... And as soon as it's safe, the, the, <laughs> the airfares are unbelievably cheap. Uh, and uh, saludos a, a todos los, 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 los profesores, todo, todas las personas extraordinariamente, uh, 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 ¿cuál, ¿cuál es la, pala la mejor palabra? La, 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 la amistad que yo encontré allá en Argentina fue extraordinaria. Uh, so, uh, I'll switch to English now. So I, I will be happy to come back. Uh, Please. Uh, it's, it's one of the one of the problems right now is that we're all sort of like locked in our worlds. But uh, but you know I, I I wish you lots of luck and uh, uh, you know hopefully you can uh, you know you can start school soon and uh, and make it happen over there. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully very soon. Thank you very much, Andres, and we look forward to keep this and many other conversations going on. Thank you for joining Talking Education, and we look forward to more of this. Saludos. Saludos a todos. Saludos. Yeah. Muchas gracias.